what I thought I would um, sort of start, as, at least in the more um, open part of the uh, talk, is to look at two things. So the book, The Chinese City, actually uh, looks at a wide range of topics, and it also is very much situated in history and context. So if you're actually ever interested in sort of um, traditional Chinese cities, then we have some coverage as well. But I thought, you know, for this uh, today, uh, it would be kind of a good start to look at two sort of almost parallel uh, developments in China's urbanization. Uh, one is how cities as a whole have sort of moved forward under market transition, so in terms of uh, urbanization, urban systems, some of the changes, and, and that will bring in the China's large geography into play. And then second, sort of more parallel uh, set of development is what we talked a little bit at lunch, which is um, how cities from within uh, have changed. That is, um, both in terms of urban form, in terms of where people live, sort of the spatial uh, uh, patterns of settlements, uh, as well as um, uh, what we call the sort of expansion, the uh, impact on land and resources. So that's what I thought I will um, focus. And um, so just give you a really quick, quick uh, glance at China's urbanization. Uh, so market transition essentially started in 1976. But really, uh, 1979 really was more of a turning point. So if we look at the last 30 years, this pace and the scope of change in China uh, probably really is unprecedented. If you look at the urbanization level, uh, China now is on par with the rest of the world in terms of almost half urbanized. But if you look at the rising number of cities, it really is quite um, shocking. And that, of course, a lot of scholars actually argue there is overestimation. But I can also uh, tell you a little bit, in a few minutes, there's also underestimation. So in a way, actually, um, most scholars actually agree that um, the 51% urbanization level is actually quite um, reasonable. And then if you look at the second to last line, the drastic change and reduction of employment in the agriculture sector. So basically within 30 years, the Chinese society has changed from a very much of an agrarian one thank you, to um, now predominantly urban. And that reflects the, uh, the rest of the world and how that has changed. But I think the pace is much faster uh, in China. And you know, I don't have to um, labor on this. And you all understand and know that China's urbanization has been driven by some very large societal forces. And some are beyond China, of course. Uh, for instance, the globalization uh, aspect of this context. Uh, but I think no other society, no other country has seen the macro forces intersecting at such a rapid pace, right? So marketization certainly is quite unique to China. Obviously, you know, um, former Soviet bloc as well as um, Vietnam uh, had gone through that as well. But again, the pace is uh, significantly faster in China. And decentralization, and this... Um, uh, in a little bit, I will spell out a little bit more on this theme. But, uh, you know, we understand that China's political system is still very much centralized. It's a one-party system. It is an authoritarian regime. But if you see how resources are allocated and how local governments are enjoying autonomy, you actually will see China is actually a very decentralized uh, country, particularly in terms of physical relations. And in fact, uh, there's been research done to show that in terms of physical relations, China is one of the, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it most, but more decentralized developing countries around the world. Um, and then, uh, of course, subs you know, industrialization and migration that all go with it. So this is a country where all these large forces intersect uh, and, and, and really 
uh, have driven urbanization to the level that you have just seen. Now, I almost then, you know, for somebody who studies um, spatial patterns and urbanization and geography, I would be remiss if I don't, you know, kind of show you this map. And this is where China, again, stands somewhat unique, uh, partially driven by the natural geography and obviously also driven by um, policies. And I want to show more of that policy at work in a little bit. So if you look at the territory of China, it's very close to the United States, 2,500 miles each way. But the similarity stops there. Um, in terms of um, resources, if you draw an imaginary line at the southwest part of the country to the northeast part of the country, so sort of this sort of um, um, this sort of imaginary line that has 40% of the land to the east, 60% of the land to the west, you will then have 95% of the population to the east on the 40% of the territory, and then 5% on the 60% of the territory. So it's very much skewed, right, in terms of population uh, distribution. Resources, on the other hand, uh, are located very differently. Most of the natural resources, and especially when you look at minimal, uh, mineral resources, um, particularly what we call the, um, blanking on the um, English word, sort of the precious minerals, uh, tend to be more to the West. And that's why, you know, if you have followed uh, news about China, the unrest to the West by the Uyghur or the uh, Muslim minorities have always been so strongly repressed, it has a lot to do with security, environmental security, energy security that are deeply embedded in those Western regions. So there's um, uh, real important uh, political dimensions uh, to this sort of continued uh, uh, control over the western part of China. So that other small map gives you a sense of how the Chinese government divides the country into three regions. Um, they are western, you see the largest territory, the poorest part of the country, central, and then the coastal or the eastern, which is the smallest of the three regions, but the wealthiest and most urbanized, most developed, and most linked globally. So there's a huge sort of uh, uh, geographical aspect to understanding China's development and urbanization. And then another aspect I want to raise to your attention, since this is a cities program, is that if you look at the distribution of cities of different sizes, you actually see a lot of very large cities, right? And here, uh, I must uh, kind of caution you, the um, the dots are an estimation, uh, an underestimation, because we're only counting urban population inside a particular city. So for Beijing and Shanghai, so uh, on the coast, you know, some of the biggest circles, right? Uh, they are far more than 4 million. But it, if you count the quote-unquote urban population within these cities, they're a little bit smaller. I will explain that in a minute or two of why there's sort of urban, then there's the rural, even within a city. But what I want to draw your attention to is that unlike many developing countries in which you have one single city dominates, right? China does not. And India is the, probably the other exception, and the former Soviet Union is another, was another. It still is. And this really gives you a sense of, well, the country is still poor, so it just graduated into the middle income group, uh, according to the UN you know, World Bank definition. Uh, it still is about uh, per capita GDP of a you know, um, few thousand dollars up, upwards to $8,000 a year, certainly much, much poorer than Latin American countries, uh, and probably on par with some Southeast Asian countries. But it's urbanization level and also how the urban system is distributed across geography. It's quite balanced, right? You have a large number of very large cities and even large number, you know, even larger number of uh, um, what we call the 
large and extra large, right? 82 plus uh, 110, that's close to 200, sort of what we call in China would be uh, large cities, but here would be, they'd be very, very large. And then if you look at the small and medium, there's just lots of them. So it's a very balanced distribution of um, um, cities across the board. Um, most countries don't have that at this level of development. And this has a lot to do with what we call uh, policies at work. But before I go there, I do want to uh, give you a sense of the challenge of understanding urban in China or in any kind of comparative work. That is, uh, how do we define urban and how uh, that definition may change over time, either um, by natural evolution or by official um, uh, policy. So this is actually really kind of tricky in China, and that's why there's a lot of disagreement among different scholars studying urbanization in China. That is, um, the official definition of cities have changed many times, and um, the official um, definition of what's the urban population has remained very much the same. Um, but so let's say in the United States, to qualify as an urban place, you have roughly, I believe, 2,500 people in the um, uh, incorporated place that qualifies you as urban for our Census Bureau. I think in Mexico, it's about the same, in the thousands. You go to Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries, you are looking at hundreds. In China, you're looking at tens of thousands, okay? Anywhere between 20,000 or more up. So it's a much uh, stricter definition. And that's, so you could say that's an underestimation of the Chinese urban population. You could actually have 70% if you have US definition. On the other hand, as I mentioned during the lunch, the Chinese city is very unique from, um, and different from many, in fact, almost all the other countries. It's that, so let's say we go to Shanghai, the largest city in China. It has 23 million population, right? We call it a municipality. It is a municipality. Nowhere else in the world you will have a agglomeration of 23 million belonging to one municipality. Nowhere in the world, nowhere in the world you will have that. But in China, that's what you have. So a municipality in China, particularly the large ones, we saw the couple hundred large cities, really are more like in a metropolitan area than as just a municipality as we understand it elsewhere around the world. And so you don't have to go very far from the center of Shanghai, or Beijing, or Tianjin, or Shenyang, to actually see rural. And these rural pockets and areas are actually located within the municipality of Shanghai, or Shenyang, or, Shang or Beijing, right? So within the 23 million of quote unquote urban population in Shanghai, some are actually not agricultural population. And of course, the majority is not agricultural uh, population. So what's the difference? I mean, why should we care if they are agricultural and non-agricultural? Of course, they all live in the city. Yes, they do matter a lot because China retains its household registration system, which is like a residency system in which, um, uh, through which uh, access to social welfare uh, is linked with your residency status. So if you are a rural person, your children really can't go to a public school in urban areas without having to go through some lengthy process, either pay more or you know, some kind of special uh, treatment and so on. And that's uh, 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 becoming a very important issue with the influx of migrants to Chinese cities. So that's another thing. So an urban person uh, can be uh, one of the four, right? So non-agriculture or agriculture, or you're registered in Shanghai, or you're somewhere, you come from somewhere else. So there's a whole lot of complexity. So then if you think of the 50% of urbanization level, you may say there is overestimation, because you might count. 
some of these who are not truly urban in terms of lifestyle, in terms of livelihood, and in terms of occupation. So there's the sort of quite unique part of Chinese urbanization. And so, there is, so I wanted to also to illustrate that the under sometimes and other times overestimation of China's urbanization has to do with policies. And this is a country in which uh, uh, the state has been quite strong. And even though it has transitioned from a, you know, ideological state to a, what we call a developmental state for which, you know, the purpose of the state has, you know, evolved into more growth, economic development, a globalizing and the marketization, and it's less based on ideology. In terms of urbanization, though, there are huge, uh, you know, sort of waves of policies at work through uh, um, uh, sort of redistrict, redesignating uh, formerly rural areas into city, you know, urban areas, and uh, also redesigning uh, the jurisdictions of cities. So I wanted to show you an example. So right around the end of 90s, for those of us who are studying China and Chinese urbanization, all of a sudden we're kind of sort of puzzled. All of a sudden, Chongqing became the largest city in China. I mean, we, 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 we always knew that Shanghai was the largest city in terms of population. How could, how could it be true, right? So for those of you who know about Shanghai, uh, China a little bit, Chongqing is a city that sits on, uh, along the Yangtze River. It's on uh, basically the upper end of the uh, Three Gorges uh, project, Three Gorges Dam, which you probably know a lot about. And so that Three Gorges STEM project, uh, you know, began to lead a number of other initiatives, which is to further develop the southwest and the more interior area of China. And so Chongqing was essentially used as a what we call a growth pole uh, at a time to lead the sort of the interior regions. And so let me just show you this map. So before 1997, Chongqing's territory was that red circle. And with a matter of a year or so, some 40 other jurisdictions, many of which were actually rural, uh, were then um, uh, merged together. And then this large territory within a matter of 1997, the, that year, became the Chongqing municipality. So this kind of uh, annexation or gerrymandering, you could say, happens not all the time or not often enough, but can happen at this kind of scale. And this obviously involved central directive. And then Chongqing also subsequently moved from being subject to the powers of Sichuan province to a city that is directly under the central government. So China actually has four cities that are directly under the central government. In a sense, it's very similar to the District of Columbia. Um, so that's how the extent to which the policy can penetrate uh, you know, uh, urbanization and urban system in China. And nothing quite like the scale, scale has happened since 1997, but on a smaller scale, this kind of a redistricting actually happens quite often. Um, and, um, and of course, no surprise that migration has been a key driver um, for this rapid pace of urbanization. And uh, you can see the total uh, number in terms of magnitude and then uh, largely short distance migration. And next you will see the coastal region as key destination. But here is the kind of interesting part that I mentioned to um, uh, your colleagues uh, at lunch is that the Chinese migration in many ways are similar to what we have seen in Latin American countries, large scale from rural areas to urban areas, uh, primarily male, uh, primarily, you know, sort of employment driven kinds of migration. But because of the household registration system that still is in effect, particularly for very large cities, but also because these rural migrants actually have land sort of holdings through collective ownership back home that they're not willing to give up, 
many of these migrants, if not the majority, are very similar to what you will see in actually in Africa, which is circular or seasonal migrants. So this weekend is Chinese New Year. Oh, actually, Monday is, but this weekend is when people will all want to go back home. And just watch the news. They already start reporting how the transportation of these migrants back home has been quite you know, torturous this year because of weather. So we're looking at millions of people during Chinese New Year going back home. And they don't just go back home during Chinese New Year. They often go back when it's harvest, harvest season. They often go back for childbirth. They often go back for uh, marriages uh, and so on, right? So this is a different kind of migrants. Now, mind you, though, some do settle in cities, and which I will show you a little bit later. So this gives you a sense also where they're coming from and where they're going to. Of course, the majority is intra-provincial. But if we look at the interprovincial migration flows, which is about 20 to 30 percent of all of the migration, um, between you know, the first five years uh, and then to the next five years, the trend hasn't really changed that much. It's all going to uh, on the east coast and particularly more southeast of the coast. And so let me then just give you a sense of um, the two largest cities in terms of how paramount and how important the migrant population is already um, uh, there. And just over time, you see the blowing, you know, sort of the rapid growing of migrant population. And it's only in 2000 census that migrants are counted, uh, starting from the 2000 census, that migrants are counted at their destination. So some of the numbers may actually not be as reliable prior. Uh, and, and so, so if you want to uh, research on China's urban populations, numbers before 2000 may actually not include migrants. So there's some, you know, sort of these issues. Uh, and you can see China's one-child policy actually has been quite, had been quite successful in urban areas, particularly very large cities. So if you look at total population change, if you take out, I should probably have um, calculated just sort of the population growth rate of non-migrant segment you will see very little growth, very little growth. Much of the population growth in almost all Chinese cities, and large ones in particular, are driven by migration. Uh, so this is like uh, quite uh, astounding, actually. Um, so aside from migration, uh, this sort of industrialization and sort of natural evolution of the uh, development in the country, uh, global forces certainly are also an important um, uh, driver for China. And uh, this number is somewhat old already, but even today it's very similar to this pattern, that you see two very large, uh, three very large clusters of destinations for foreign direct investment. So the top one is the capital region, and the middle one is Shanghai, or what we call the lower Yangtze uh, Delta region with a number of um, very important destinations. The second largest bubble in that uh, region uh, is Suzhou. And then the lower uh, third is at the Pearl River Delta, right next to Hong Kong. And this was the very earliest destination of FDI, as well as internal migration. But now it's sort of its you know, dominance is given away to the uh, Yangtze River Delta. And so that is not just only showing FDI and where it goes. It also gives you a sense that Chinese urbanization is maturing. That is, that it's begin to uh, resemble a lot of urban regions around the world. So you go to Japan, you have you know, Hokkaido you know, between uh, Osaka and uh, Tokyo, where you have a cluster of large cities complementing uh, their functions, and you go to Germany, you know, in U.S., we have, you know, sort of D.C. is right in the middle of it from Boston all the way uh, to here, um, that sort of urban corridor in China that's certainly forming. And um, most of us who study China believe that these are going to be the centers of growth further down in the next few decades in terms of uh, 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 driving the uh, uh, economic uh, 
growth of the country and being the more um, sort of innovative centers of the country. But that's also where you will see more um, environmental implications uh, that stemming, that stem from urbanization. Uh, um, in fact, uh, around Shanghai is probably your most fragile types of landscape and ecology for this sort of intensive urbanization because a lot of it is sits on uh, a delta and has erosion issues, has uh, um, uh, natural um, landscaping issues. And so in terms of urban areas, the middle uh, circle in the region is probably the most vulnerable. But in terms of the overall, uh, if uh, I think the big report you're writing might also come down to how sort of human and environmental interactions may be intensified in certain pockets of a country that actually right around Chongqing, uh, sort of the middle part of the country is where the density of population and land uh, is probably quite simply the, the most intense across the country. So we're not just looking at urban in that, re that area. We're looking at both urban and rural because a large concentration of population. Okay, so that gives us a sense of, you know, overall, if you look at the urban picture, look at urbanization and urban system, where cities have grown more, a space, you know, sort of across different regions, where are the big pockets of growth, where are the big destinations of migration, and that gives you a sense. So clearly, this scope of change and this pace of change also has happened uh, within cities in terms of how people live, how people travel to work, how people um, uh, uh, use land, and, uh, and how people uh, interact with um, each other. So I wanted to kind of uh, bring us back to uh, on the more ground level of looking at cities. So when I was growing up, so I grew up, I guess, in the 70s um, and the 60s, um, um, many of you probably know about this thing called the work unit in China, which is uh, quite, so I, I, I did mention here sort of what we call work unit compounds. I grew up in a small college where my parents taught uh, in a small city uh, south of Beijing in Shandong province. So when I grew up, uh, we lived in the same place my parents worked. So all of the working units or the work units provided housing, right? And to its employees. So that the student housing of the college was on the campus. The faculty housing was on campus. The campus had a daycare center. And if you had a bigger campus, you might even have an elementary school. In fact, the university I went to had not only an elementary school, it had a high school. It had its, own power gen had its own power generation capacity, and also, and so on. So before 1980, Chinese cities were very much organized around these compounds. These, are essentially, these were essentially your neighborhoods. I knew nobody except everybody who worked in my parents' colleges, or my classmates, right? But many of my classmates, especially my friends, uh, were all from the college compound. And so work and housing had a very close connection. Now, that doesn't mean everybody did. You know, let's say if my mother, by whatever reason, didn't work in the college, she might have to commute a whole lot. So, but overall, particularly in the smaller cities, sort of the work housing balance or job housing balance was a very different kind of picture, right? So commuting was far less of an issue and transportation was far more organized on around what we call non-work trips. And so um, that really changed in 1998. Essentially, all of the work units, especially state-owned work units, were no longer allowed to provide housing. And housing was, I wouldn't call it privatized, but it was what we, the Chinese would call it commodified. Because the government, municipal governments, governments, even until today, continue to be involved in provision of housing, particularly uh, in affordable housing, low-rent housing, uh, 
Uh, and that's why you know, we don't always call it privatization. But housing were no longer uh, a, uh, a uh, you know, since 1998, housing is no longer a welfare item. You really actually have to pay for it. And in fact, housing price is ridiculous in Chinese cities. Uh, and that's another thing I think that you will want to compare with some other cities that housing today in, uh, it's easily we're looking at in Shanghai, any sort of accessible areas, not too far from the city center. You're looking at a um, apartment of something like um, 1,500 square foot will co easily cost you a million dollar. I'm talking about US dollar, I'm not talking about Chinese yuan. Uh, it's that kind of price. Uh, has a lot to do with, um, of course, um, some other factors. But in any case, so since 1998, you don't have that kind of linkage between uh, housing and work. And neighborhoods are organized much more differently today uh, from back then. And back then also, um, you know, it was more what we call egalitarian city. Now, it's very similar to the old Soviet cities. That is, so in the college that I lived in, you know, anywhere from, you know, the maintenance worker to the college president, we lived in the same neighborhood, right? We might even live in the same building. Um, although the differentiation between different types of work units could be quite large. If you are a very large work unit, you could do very well. In fact, the university I went to in Beijing was always very well off, right? Never suffered from power outages and so on. So, and it was very low profile, uh, and that has a lot to do with the austerity that was prevailing at the time, and technology, right? So walking scale, and we all know China was sort of this um, uh, bicycle city, um, bicycle country. And so today, as we have seen here, uh, and I'll show you some evidence there that uh, real estate development is becoming important. Uh, real estate companies uh, are really important players in uh, urban development. And then uh, increasingly, we're looking at uh, motorization uh, in terms of uh, mode of transport. So this is Shanghai. Uh, I don't have the most recent, but if you, f you take a look at this, and Shanghai actually is not as typical because it actually has a far more effective travel management, uh, uh, or travel demand management uh, scheme, so that the rise in car ownership has not been as stark as in many other cities. So if you look at Beijing, you actually will see that third legend from the bottom be far bigger share uh, than here. And if you're interested in sort of the uh, travel demand management that have gone into Shanghai, I'd be happy to talk about later. But Beijing is using that too, particularly for Olympic and other purposes. But what you are seeing is the rapid decline of walking and bicycling in the recent decade and the increasing uh, you know, uh, motorization. And public transit remains to be a very important mode. Uh, and that's the pride that I take in Chinese cities is that it is actually quite easy to get, you know, get around through public transit um, and, and lots of public investment in public transit. So that's sort of a one key aspect in Chinese cities today that is very different from, uh, you know, let's say 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, of the sort of the people increasingly have more mobility in terms of where they can get to, in terms of what kind of housing they can live in. That mobility is, you know, not surprisingly, as in many other cities around the world, accompanied by increasing spatial differentiation. That is, you have upper corners, lower corners of uh, the city now occupied by people of different income. And it's primarily, of course, organized uh, by social economic uh, status, but certainly also um, by your local versus non-local status, that is, whether you're migrants or not. Now, let me spend a minute about, you know, well, actually, maybe um, in a minute or so, uh, I will show that about the migrants situation, because I did spend a lot of years studying migrants, and I really am uh, very uh, interested in 
continue to uh, sort of monitor how they uh, fare in cities. And so very much like in Latin American countries or Southeast Asian countries, migrants do concentrate in Chinese cities. They don't, however, concentrate in the sense of like squatter settlements or slums. They might be concentrated in what we call these urban villages, so formerly rural areas in cities. As I mentioned, you, know, you don't have to go very far to find these uh, formerly rural villages. Now today we call them urban villages. And then um, within the local population, you also begin to see more you know, the up, upper corners and the lower corners. And this gives you a sense of how they look like today. So over lunch, we also talked a little bit about how challenging it is to up, upgrade the housing stock um, in many of Chinese uh, largest cities. And uh, you know, someone mentioned that the percentage of slums in Chinese cities might be something around 20 to 25 percent, and I would, and that's not surprising. So the 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 top left uh, picture actually is where my grandmother used to live um, in Shanghai, uh, a very center part of Shanghai, and um, on Huaihai Road. But the housing stock is from the early 20th century, very much like the British row housing uh, for the working class. And it looks OK from outside, but inside there is no plumbing. There is no uh, hot water supply. Uh, the only real facility is electricity and gas uh, for cooking. Uh, there is no real indoor heating either because it's south of Yangtze River. Uh, you know, China has the official policy of south of Yangtze River. There is no mandatory uh, indoor heating for any housing provision. So that's still today. And it looks sort of uh, uh, acceptable from outside. Uh, and then five minutes walk from that neighborhood, you see the right, the top right neighborhood, which is sort of uh, 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 you know, historical, uh, uh, historically just like this, but completely torn down for redevelopment, even though the architectural style is sort of historical, it really is all new development, higher density, office, and multi-use, you know, multi-purposes uh, in terms of um, uh, residential, official uh, office, and this little bit of commercial. And then you kind of move a little bit to the, uh, I wouldn't call it outskirts, but more of what the Chinese would call it, the inner suburbs. And I would not confuse that with the suburbs we see here, like Arlington would be inner suburbs, but it really is not like this. In China, inner suburbs merely indicate that it's outside the central city. The density remains very high, so to the bottom right, that's actually where my parents now live, um, uh, is what we call the commercialized housing stock. It's very, very typical of um, the new types of housing that you can purchase on the market uh, um, in very large cities or even smaller cities. And this is just uh, maybe 10 minutes away from this neighborhood, of course, about 10 years ago, though. But I want to showcase to you what an urban village would look like. And some urban villages are looking exactly like this even today. That is, they are really walled around by uh, new urban development, but you kind of can, could guess that all of those office buildings are sitting on formerly agricultural land. This was in, so this is and was in Pudong. Um, and then um, because the village just had a lot of residents, it was very difficult and costly to relocate. The developers, subsequently the city, essentially left the village alone without the agricultural land. And so a lot of the villagers had to rent to migrants. And then this became essentially a concentrated area uh, of uh, migrant population. So I'm not sure I have the map here. But um, for Shanghai, if you look at 2000, the central city, and the heaviest concentration of migrants were right outside of the central city. And in 2010, that pattern remained, except right around the central city, many neighborhoods actually have more migrants than local residents. So a lot of them live in similar situations, but some are actually better situations. But this is what we called 
you know, so the, the concentration of migrants. You certainly can call this slum because the conditions of the housing uh, are really quite poor, but they are not built in a way of like through invasion, through squatting, or through sort of quote unquote illegal settlements. Um, and then the economic space of the cities also has changed drastically. I mean, you can see the kind of density, you can see the sort of the, uh, the differentiation in terms of what kind of market segments the different commercial spaces are catering to. So uh, on the top uh, left is your sort of catering to local residents, catering to uh, migrants, sort of still very traditional, and then 20 minutes away from there. Uh, this is all in the central part of Shanghai. All three picture to this side and that other to the bottom right is not in Shanghai. And you see the sort of the most expensive commercial areas. And then this here is uh, what I mentioned to you that traditional, traditional for Shanghai is only about a century old. So it's somewhat atypical of Chinese cities. But these housing stock here on the bottom left is about 100 year old. And without really upgrading inside, it's turned into sort of heritage you know, uh, tourism. So sort of residents still live up there. And the bottom is for commercial and stuff because it's almost like it's quaint to see how you know, old the living quarters are. So that kind of um, change is happening. Oh yeah, I do have the, 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 the maps. So that's to the left is 2000 in terms of percentage of migrants in total population. So you can see the darker uh, 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 areas right surrounding the central city. In that sense, it's actually quite similar to Latin American countries. So you know, if you go to Sao Paulo, most of the squatter settlement you see are on the outskirts, right? You go to Mexico City, that's where you see. But this is not to the farthest outskirts of Shanghai City. So the city, if you look at the whole map, especially the wider, you know, sort of almost non-colored um, uh, areas are still agriculture or rural. But they all belong to the Shanghai municipality. Okay. If I, if I take it a second and then we'll. Yeah. It's a good time if anybody has any questions. So yeah, the question is, so the migrants who are concentrated around the central city area, typically they don't have hukou or the household registration, so how do they get access right, to services? So uh, that's really uh, very much the case. And so because they rent oftentimes from, so you don't have the sort of these squatter settlements that we see in other kinds of cities where services are essentially refused until you know at a certain point there's some kind of connection, right? So in the Chinese cities then, because they rent from urban residents, so the basic facilities are there. It's really when it comes down to uh, education, uh, that's really challenging. So what we have seen is um, uh, the um, uh, emergence of um, migrant schools. So schools opened up by uh, migrant entrepreneurs or uh, schools that allow migrants to come in, public schools, with some kind of surcharge or some kind of arrangements, uh, or migrants who migrate without their children. So in fact, um, there's a lot of evidence that the Chinese countryside has been what we call feminized, uh, but also uh, um, older or younger. So there's a huge sort of separation of family in, through that. And in fact, if anything, um, some people also argue that the Chinese migrants have a, what we call a split household strategy. That is, you know, some 
members of the uh, family go work in the cities and uh, you know uh, earn a better living, but the base of the family remains to be in the countryside, which adds to sort of the circular nature of the migration. But some migrants are doing better. So you know now something like about 10% of migrants who are from the countryside actually own uh, housing units in cities. Uh, especially in smaller cities. If, if they're able to buy, they can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question is about, in addition to access to schools, uh, what about access to healthcare? So healthcare is another interesting story that we, the Chinese wouldn't call it privatized, but it's commodified. So it's still provided by the public sector mostly, right, and then public hospitals. But you have to pay. It's um, pay as you go. In fact, in China, you actually have to pay first before you get services. So some migrants do receive um, uh, some benefits, especially if they work for um, state-owned enterprises. So they will have medical insurance, OK? But if they work for themselves or they work for privately held uh, firms, then they have to pay on their own. So the migrants that I have, I have worked with Really, many of them either go back home because they have a rural, there's a separate rural scheme of um, health insurance that's managed by the government, actually, um, mm -hmm. and, which is a lot less expensive, but the service is also, also much more basic. So they would do that. So when real sickness or you know, child, childbearing, they go back. But overall, they don't always seek services. So that's the, the, also a major challenge. In, in, in Chinese cities. So um, just to repeat that, that, um, uh, that generally um, uh, sort of expenses of a health care are not very high, and uh, uh, especially in terms of visiting. Although, um, so that's an interesting question that um, if we look at, so China remains to be a country where we call it uh, cash poor and asset rich. So you actually have lots of households that own more than one housing units, but income-wise, it's still relatively low. So, um, I mean, it certainly is cheaper compared to U.S., but healthcare can be a substantial expense um, for migrants if you look at the percentage of their income spent on it, if you, you know, uh, uh, sort of use the similar kind of um, care. Uh, and also the Chinese system is more of a primary care types of uh, uh, system so that you don't go strict to specialist and that cuts down on the expenses as well. Yeah. We have a little more time for another question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you spoke at the beginning about this um, great rise in the migration and you also spoke about policy a very complex set of policies of all kinds. Would you say the migration was a, a deliberate goal of the Chinese government? Mm -hmm. or, it, or were policies trying to resist the migration? Okay, yeah, very good question. So the question is about that, you know, we see the rise of migration and, um, and whether that was a deliberate goal or whether the policies are resisting, you know, migration. So um, China is one of these few countries over time has had a quite effective uh, population control mechanism. Uh, 
um, you know, Soviet Union had that, what would they call it, internal passport, and China used the system and still is using the system of household registration to maintain a mobility control. But, and this was sort of a double-edged sword, right? Because uh, the one-child policy that had been so effective in Chinese cities essentially has, had created a very much of a labor shortage. Uh, in uh, a Chinese city, so that's on one side. Second is, you, you had a society in 1980 that was 20% urbanized, 80% in a rural sector, but agricultural land in terms of per capita arable land is very scarce. You can't support 80% of the population on the land, and in the early 80s that the agriculture sector went through reform first and product productivity increased drastically. And so rural livelihood actually improved the most in the early part of the 80s. But there you then have what they call the army of surplus labor. So what would you do with that, right? So that plus the demand of urban economies uh, uh, sort of pushed the central government to relax the uh, mobility control policy. So 1983 was the turning point in which that the so-called temporary migration was allowed. And even today, it's still called temporary migration. It's still called floating population because the expectation had always been that they would go back home eventually. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, sort of in a sense of agriculture land remain to be sort of collectively owned and so subsequently farmers have a stake in it and, and they can't really transfer with the exception of some experimental places. Um, and so that land remains to be the social security of farmers. And, um, but in cities, they, um, they are having all these barriers to settle. So the policies are, in a way, both encouraging migration, on the other hand, also discouraging settlements in the cities. And there was a lot, I remember in the 90s working with the Ministry of Agriculture on this issue, that there was a lot of emphasis on hoping to encourage migrants to return, to create, you know, on, you know, uh, you know, with the experience that they've had in cities to create, you know, small businesses and so on. That hasn't really materialized to a large scale. And so um, what happens today is that, uh, you know, you all know that the one-child policy has been relaxed now. And that has a lot to do with how China is increasingly aging. It's getting older before it's getting richer. And the labor shortages of cities are going to be significantly manifested in cities around 2030 and 2035. And so uh, the, migrants pop, the migrant population is, is continually filling that void. And so today I would say overall, if you look at municipal and local policies towards migrants, it have, they have been improving, really. They have been a lot more tolerant a uh, lot more uh, conducive to better treatment of uh, migrants. Um, you don't see the kind of uh, sort of uh, very harsh treatment that we saw in the 90s and even the early 2000s. Oh, works now. Great, no problem. Yep. So, um, so that's, so by 2010, you still see the concentration. Obviously, the scale has changed. Now there are, in some neighborhoods, six times or five times of local population. So we couldn't have this kind of dark percentage anymore. But it's, in a sense, still around the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, central city, you have large concentration of migrants. So I got to hit the screen, right? OK, now I'm good. OK. So here's another kind of interesting part from um, perhaps rather different patterns of migrant settlement in cities from cities around the world or Latin America specifically, is that I call them sojourners in the city, is that they remain to be very mobile in the cities because um, uh, they live continuously in this rental housing and oftentimes some of the rental housing stock has to be redeveloped and so on. They also live a lot in work-related housing. So, so if you go to Sao Paulo, you go to uh, uh, Santiago and so on, what you see is a process in which migrants come to the city first and they rent, 
and they are in crowded conditions and later on they might squat or they may start building their own self-help housing or other kinds and they, they kind of uh, uh, decentralize towards the uh, peripheral areas. But they generally make the transition of what you know um, John Turner would call it from bridgeheads to consolidators, that is from renters to owners. Uh, in Chinese cities, you don't see that very much. There are, uh, uh, and also, uh, they tend to move far more uh, in terms of uh, time than local residents, and they move far more uh, than migrants in other cities around the world. So very few makes that transition. But when they move, they don't move very far. Um, they actually, essentially, only getting to know the cities in sort of a small area, they tend to move close by. So that's kind of, so you think about migrants in Chinese cities in a way of a, 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 a sort of, um, not only within city move, and there's quite a bit also intra-city moves as well. So this gives you a sense of migrant living conditions. Um, you could call all of this, right, uh, slums, and they are indeed slums, um, but none of them except the boat is really sort of illegal, right? So this left uh, bottom uh, was the old village, uh, uh, sort of temporary housing by the old uh, village residents who were local, who would uh, you know, sort of build these structures to stay temporarily when they work on the field. And now they rent. Can you believe they actually rent this kind of units to migrants because only the migrants now uh, do the agricultural labor. And the same with that is renting in the urban village of some vegetable uh, vendors who are also migrants. And this is what I talked about during lunch in which the migrants and the local villagers collaborate and create some industrial parks for uh, you know, labor-intensive manufacturing. And this is in Beijing in a, one of the urban villages as well. So last but not least, I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about the sort of whole issue of the human development or urban development and the interaction with the natural environment and the resources. And so in, in, in Chinese city, what you also have seen is actually quite interestingly, a very much of what we call leapfrog development. That is, uh, you know, yes, density is higher, but the density is not high enough. Actually, if you guys uh, use, you know, floor area ratio, FAR, as, a, um, as sort of an indicator, Chinese cities, as soon as you get out of the central city, into the inner suburb areas, you're going to see maybe two to three floors, so two to three, two to five FAR kind of density, which is quite low compared to places like Hong Kong, certainly, or Seoul, or even some Western cities. So there is this issue of land not being used very efficiently just outside of the central city. It has a lot to do, of course, with uh, uh, the 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 there's an incentive for local governments to rent out the right to use land or lease them out to make money for the local governments and no matter what kind of development comes into play. But it also has to do with a lot of these land remain under rural ownership regime, which is collective. If you have interest in that, I can explain more of that. And so, and uh, um, so I just want to actually show you a picture of how this has kind of uh, uh, come about over time. So this is Nanjing. It's uh, the uh, capital city of Jiangsu province, just north of Shanghai. So in 1990, the footprint of the city uh, was such. By 2000, uh, there you have, you have you know, quite a bit leaf, leapfrogging. Uh, 2005, uh, further expansion. Um, and, you know, the city obviously couldn't expand to westward because of Yangtze River in 2010. Um, uh, so in terms of the physical footprint of urban development. And so what you see is there's quite a bit rural agriculture type of land sort of uh, infilled in between and often in a sense very... I wouldn't call it very similar to urban sprawl, and that's why sometimes smart growth and urban sprawl 
kind of literature is relevant to Chinese planners and uh, urban officials because you actually do see that. Uh, not even to very suburban areas, you can actually see it in very large cities. Nanjing is something like 10 million population, and this is what you uh, can see sort of how land development has sort of followed a pattern of this sort of uh, less than high density and sort of leapfrogging fragmented kinds of pattern and reasons that I can explain if you are interested. And that's, you know, so I explained that land is not just land in Chinese cities. It's also a very valuable source of income for uh, local governments because land is all owned by state, but the right to use it can be leased out. And so many local governments lease out land to make money and to augment um, uh, augment uh, uh, local physical basis. So, um, so land now um, is increasingly becoming not just the natural resources, but also a commodity to be uh, really used by uh, uh, local governments for that purposes, which creates a lot of inefficiencies because um, particularly given the housing bubbles and real estate bubbles, and some of the land that has been sort of uh, allocated for urban uses are not always used properly or undeveloped remain for a number of years, which kind of excludes the sort of the more efficient uses to be allocated. And this is sort of in a way of telling you this land issue is probably more acute naturally for some of the very large cities, the densest cities in the eastern regions. That is, uh, the land supply is essentially running out. So if you look at to the more east part of this graph, or the, you know, sort of the left side of the graph, and then the physical gap uh, remains quite large. And so um, there it gives you that sense. Anyway, so I, I know I'm running out of time, and so I wanted to really kind of um, give you in a summary of this sort of, so the urban China today, different from the days when I grew up in, is becoming far more stratified from both within and across cities in terms of, you know, the spatial form, the neighborhoods, and so on within cities, as well as in terms of the level of development across different cities in different regional locations. And certainly we are going to see more um, cent uh, you know, concentrated in urban development around those three regions, potentially two more, one to the northeast and one around Chongqing. And I think probably more relevant to you all, your interest, is this uh, human environmental relations that will probably be the most significant challenges uh, to the path of urbanization in the next few decades. So um, so I want to end from at there, uh, and then you'd be happy to answer uh, more questions. Um, so there's the book um, that I talked about that if you're interested in uh, learning more about. Okay, so the question is about how do municipal governments, you know, um, deal with agricultural land in their jurisdiction, right? So, you know, of course the incentive is, particular for physical in income and revenues, is, about, is to, you know, develop as much urban, you know, uh, types of use as possible, right? So a couple of answers to your question is that, um, as I mentioned, there are pockets of rural villages in these cities. They're not just rural pockets in terms of land use. In terms of administrative status, they're also different. 
even though they're in the city, they're really part of the rural administration. That is to say, land is collectively owned by that village, not actually really owned by the municipality, if that land is designated as agriculture. So for the municipality to actually try to turn it to a developer, it actually needs to first to use planning as, you know, as, as a way of saying, as a guidance to, so that is necessary for urban development. I have to actually acquire it and change the nature of the land, change it from agriculture to rural, change it from agricultural to urban develop, I'm sorry, agriculture to urban, to urban development. And then uh, since 2005, the central government has essentially required localities to use a market bidding process for transferring those um, use rights. That's happening, but continuously we see a substantial amount of land transfer con happens through administrative allocation, and which really, again, leads to some inefficiencies and leads to corruption and so on. Um, so that's one part, but I also want to give you another part, which is a key reason for this fragmented patterns of development. Um, I mentioned earlier, the per capita arable land in China is very scarce. Food security is actually a significant concern on the minds of the central government. And so there has been and remains to be a very important central directive in terms of agriculture land conservation. And so the government actually over time has tried a different types of policies to enforce that. One of which was a quota system. That is, um, um, every municipalities and provinces need to keep certain percentage of land uh, or remain to be agriculture. And so for municipalities that over that quota, then, you know, or under that quota, you can actually buy quotas elsewhere. So very much like the emission market that we have seen around the world. And so, so for some of these municipalities, um, essentially these pockets of rural land are kept from development, because they're not efficient in terms of both agricultural production as well as in terms of uh, conservation. But they're kept because of the need for local governments to maintain that quota. So you have these very small pieces of agriculture land that remain to be unconsolidated uh, in many cities. Uh, although in more recent times, that is changing. A lot of cities now are acquiring and consolidate agriculture land and putting them in the hands of the big agribusinesses to make productivity uh, rise. So it's actually a really um, com complex question. I have a question about the, the rural villages. So you, you take a look at that and it looks like it's really low density and I'm wondering why you know you have this collective land they can stand to make a lot of money by you know really high intensity real estate mm -hmm. development why do you think that a lot of those are still sort of low density pockets in a higher density city yeah the incentive doesn't seem to go that way yeah so the question is about so we look at the urban villages they are very low in density why hasn't there been incentive to development into higher density you know urban uses uh, good question. So again, I give you a couple of reasons at least. So one is that the way in which relocation and redevelopment has been done in Chinese cities have changed as well. But for many years, in order for a developer subsequently also, if you know, because the um, the municipality has to acquire the land first, you have to relocate uh, these residents. And so if it, it, even if it's low density in this case, you still see an area like that, if not thousands of residents, maybe hundreds. The relocation cost is actually really expensive because in the old days, you actually have to provide housing. And even early on in the 80s and 90s, you actually have to provide jobs to the residents here. And now the relocation scheme has changed. You don't necessarily provide housing. You could, but there's an alternative of providing um, uh, what we call it uh, an income, so uh, cash in lure of housing. And so that's becoming a little bit more incentive on the development side. So, and that's why the Chinese developers will call these villages the hard bones because you're actually really hard to uh, bite them because you are, there's a huge relocation 
cost, resettlement cost to it. So that was more of the 90s and 2000s kind of stories. And the second part that continues to work really kind of interestingly in many cities, for instance, Shanghai doesn't have a whole lot of urban villages, but if you go to the sort of peri-urban areas in Beijing and even somewhat central areas in Guangzhou, in the further southern part of China, you see more urban villages. Also has to do with what I mentioned earlier, the status, the, the administrative status. This is still rural. There's a corporation here, the rural co-op. And they actually um, oftentimes are not willing to give up you know, sort of the status and change into urban. And of course, the municipalities also has to come in and, you know, turn them into urban uh, neighborhoods and that often ha happens in a sort of a forced way. But many of these local rural co-ops have very profitable businesses on these lands. They rent land to foreign investors, they rent land to other things. And so it's quite good income and they refuse to be convert it. And so that's one uh, uh, reason. And the uh, second is um, in many of these large cities, forced relocation has created a lot of unrest. And a lot of, uh, you know, you probably have seen pictures of, you know, these nail houses where one single household refuses to move, right, because of disagreement over a compensation. So that, uh, so in the 2000s, uh, China finally had a property rights law, you know, somewhat similar to what we have, the Fifth Amendment here, but not quite. Um, so what it does is it gives the individuals not only the right to protect for their property, but also what they call the right to livelihood, right? Because they also run businesses and so on. So that's made the forced resettlement a lot harder now. So municipalities are not as sort of uh, free willing in the sense that in the 90s that you just see that they basically bulldozed everywhere they wanted to redevelop, yeah. Oh yes, so the question is about how policies have changed, particularly those towards migrants, for instance, housing. Yeah, really good question. Um, so when I first started studying migration and migrant housing in the mid-90s, there were very few types of urban housing that were open to migrants, right? So the migrants primarily rent from these villagers or the uh, lived in dormitories and, and, and construction sites, you know, temporary housing, um, or they um, basically um, stayed in workplaces. Uh, um, but renting and dormitory types of housing were the main uh, uh, forms. So in 2000, when we surveyed migrants, only about 1% of the migrants actually owned a housing unit in cities. Well, I studied the two biggest cities, Beijing and Shanghai. But by 2005, we used the national survey data, and that showed about 10% housing ownership uh, in cities. Overall, in China, uh, in urban China, housing ownership is close to 80%. So that's really high. Migrants are still like, you know, 10 to 15%. But you know, all of them own housing back home, right? Um, so what has happened is a couple of other um, types of housing uh, have been opened up to migrants. So one is sort of the older commercial units that have been traded that migrants can buy now. And certainly the new commercial units, you know, one of the pictures I show you, the sort of new neighborhoods, if they have the cash, then they can buy except you, they are not qualified to uh, use the urban mortgage system, like using banks and having you know, mortgage and taking out loans, they can't do that. So a lot of it is cash income uh, and cash transactions. So today I think only two major um, segments of the housing market uh, remain close to migrants in these large cities. One is the uh, affordable housing. So local governments have these affordable housing stocks that are developed by developers uh, through sort of a, what we call a linkage requirement that you see in American cities. You know, if you develop this much, 15% have to be low income. And so that is not open to migrants. That's only open to urban residents. And then there's also a low rent uh, housing program in Chinese cities that is uh, through old housing stocks that is rented to um, 
uh, low-income urban residents only. So um, that's the change, really, quite significant. Yeah. younger generation of migrant workers mm -hmm. coming to many cities in China, mostly they were, uh, they were born in the 1980s and 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, compared to their, um, compared to the earlier generation, they usually have more years in school and uh, I guess less agriculture skills. Mm -hmm. They have spending most of the years in school. Um, how do you see, you know, how different they are from the yeah, earlier generations in terms of their jobs in the cities, in mm -hmm. terms of their you know, expectations, um, or you know how long they plan to stay in the city, and how does this difference going to change the urbanization in China? Yeah. So the question is about you know the recent uh, rise of younger migrants who were born either in the eighties or nineties coming to cities and how their lives may be different or similar to the earlier migrants and how that uh, may affect um, China's uh, cities. Um, yes, this is what we call the second generation. You know, in fact, some of them may have even been born in cities because, you know, if their parents had migrated in the 80s, right, and then they, um, uh, or at least even grew up in these migrant schools and in the cities. Um, this is a, um, there's been some research about this in terms of how they integrate into cities and how they um, become really part of the urban population. So it's really interesting. So if I go to a Chinese city and if I, you know, wander around on the streets, especially um, outside the central city, sort of a little bit less, you know, fancy kinds of areas, I can pretty much tell right away who are migrants, who are not migrants, you know, the store owners and so on and so forth, especially if they start talking because then the accent will come through. But with the younger generation, you can't always tell because they really are far more urbanized and they are far more modernized. And so, and you're absolutely right in terms of they also do not have the agricultural skills that, that their parents or the first generation have. So they don't have the connection uh, to the um, uh, land and the villages the same way that they're the older generation has so um, this has become an, an, an important uh, issue and they remain to be actually quite interesting is uh, if you ask migrants do you want to stay many really do want to stay right uh, especially they say if we can buy used housing units not that expensive we want to stay but a significant number of them don't want to stay, especially the older generation. Partially that's binded by the residency restriction that they don't know if they can stay, right? So you can survive quite well if you are in smaller cities because hukou doesn't matter all that much anymore. And we also know a larger percentage of migrants work in the service sector. Uh, than the local population. In fact, more than half of the uh, migrant population essentially are in the service sector. A lot of sort of self-employed, small businesses working for private businesses, a non-state sector. It's a lot harder to get into the state sector to work as a migrant, right? So um, I would say um, they do relatively well in the, the more segmented labor market you know, lower income, maybe uh, somewhat of a gray color types of work, uh, and but they are still far less represented in the uh, higher income, more skilled uh, segments of the labor market. And of course, you have college grads, but we don't consider them in the same way as we consider the labor migrants. So this is what a lot of researchers will call the, you know, the really the increasingly growing urban underclass in Chinese cities are these, um, you know, um, both older and younger generation of migrants, as well as um, the furloughed state workers, you know, the, the less educated state workers who kind of essentially were laid off when the state enterprises went through restructuring in the 1990s, right? So th these are the, essentially the urban poor of Chinese cities today. Yeah. Thank you.
Mm -hmm. um, and you know, based on what you're saying about how uh, you know, a lot of migrants are in the services, um, you know, what what types of employment shifts and maybe migration shifts do you think might accompany this restructuring of services? Okay, yeah, so the question is about, you know, given that the large context of economic restructuring in the Chinese um, uh, economy in general is moving from more from manufacturing more to services, you know, how that affects uh, migrants, both in terms of where they work and also, uh, you know, the spatial patterns of migration. Um, so, so it's actually in really interesting. So let me go back to this picture. How do I? So, uh, actually, maybe not this one. Uh, then, uh, this one, okay. Um, this actually already started to show you a little bit of that of effect. Um, so the earliest globalizing regions of China uh, was in uh, the southeast uh, Pearl River Delta area. You know, I actually, when I did my doctoral dissertation in the early 90s, that's what I studied. Now, you see the, how thick the arrows were, and now you see the next. They're still there, but the thickness of the arrow has changed. And so this really, so if you think about China as the world of, of, of the factory of the world, it was essentially the Pearl River Delta is the factory of the world, not really the entire China. But that really has changed, and much in the same way as if you think about Korea, South Korea, you know, sort of Pusan and all that along the coast, the export processing zones essentially emptied out as these uh, late, footloose manufacturing global factories moved to China and now subsequently moved to Southeast Asia. Uh, we began to see a little bit of that here in, uh, in this uh, region, and also, uh, because a lot of these um, factories in the Pearl Delta River area uh, were very labor intensive, a lot of them owned by Taiwanese, Hong Kongese small firms that aren't doing that well to start with. And so um, there actually has been some labor shortages in that region. That the migrants no longer, you, you, it's really interesting how um, the perception of migrants has been changing that where, where con constitute the most desirable destinations also is changing. And so, as you can see, it's moving north a little bit, particularly towards a little bit more towards um, um, the lower Yangtze River Delta. And so, um, um, you're seeing there a little bit, still manufacturing, but a little bit of a little bit higher end manufacturing. So the shoe factories, the uh, the furniture, the little, the toys, the ornaments tend to be more lower uh, in the south, and some of the sort of, you know, for instance, uh, this other circle. Oh no, sorry. So the middle circle, uh, red circle, and the second largest black circle in the the red circle is Suzhou, for instance, right? Um, it's primarily sort of what we call high-tech zone and high-tech, it's mid-tech, you know, chips, um, information, communication technologies, types of manufacturing, lots of Singapore investment, uh, and a little more um, European and U.S. investment. And so that's very different from, so if you look at the source of investors, is quite a bit different in that middle red circle from the lower one. And so that's really changing the the the, the the sort of the destination distribution of migration quite a bit. But, you know, I think the change from manufacturing to service is going to be a very long process for China. It's certainly, in, not all of it is um, uh, conscious um, development and planning uh, at work because you also see labor costs rising in China. And so some of this truly footloose um, Western firms have already moved out of China and going to Vietnam and Southeast Asia and so on. And so, the, so this, you know, sort of some of it is, is reaction to that.
And, and then some of the service sector work tends to be far more sort of what we call consumer services than real truly producer services. But that said, though, China has emerged to be a significant des destination for global research and development, R&D, particularly around Beijing and to a lesser extent around Shanghai. Nothing much in the lower southeast circle. That's using a different type of labor, though, um, and that's using a more educated labor. So, so what we are seeing today is the Chinese migrant population is differentiating. So you have increasingly seeing different kinds of migrants, you know, more educated, more skilled, and less educated. So the, the, the segmentation of even within the migrant population is increasing.